All right, a lot to go over. I feel like we need to catch up on stage live here. A um, couple of months ago, I called you after I watched your documentary on white privilege. Um, and I tend to like to be uncomfortable. I like to be in situations where I'm learning things that I did not know or maybe challenging things that I did know. And um, I've watched you really focus on societal issues since the election. I think you were the first person I spoke to the day after the election. I flew overnight. And um, racism is something that we suffer from in America. I'm really curious as to what pushed you into the topic and which ultimately became the special of white privilege. Uh, well, I think after the election, I had such a, a reaction that it was almost like, um, you know, like a toddler's reaction to not, things not going your way. Like, I couldn't believe it. Like, I was stomping my feet. Like, no, this can't be real. And I had to look at my reaction and the fact that I'm adult and that I was acting like a spoiled brat and where that was coming from. And, you know, you hear the, ter you heard the term elitist bubbles. And I was like, that's not me. I'm from New Jersey. My father was a used car dealer. Like I came up by my bootstraps. I didn't have privilege. I didn't have it. I'm not an elitist. And it's like being white is a privilege. That is a privilege in this country. In any country, it's a privilege. You get considered in a different way if you have white skin. So the idea that some white people don't think that they're a beneficiary of white privilege because they didn't go to Harvard or Yale or had trust funds is, is not necessarily true. I think we all experience privilege that we don't necessarily take into account until we're faced with you know, uh, a reality that makes us look at ourselves in a different way. And do you think that's, where I, where I get uncomfortable, is that something that you need to prove to your black colleagues or your black friends? Or is it something that you need to come to, you know, uh, to, you know, brass tacks about, about yourself first? Yeah, it's not really about, you know, it, it can appear like virtue signaling and, and, you know, that is true to a degree. People want to, I, you know, you want to be a more responsible person. You want to be, I want to be a better ally. I don't want to just talk about being an ally. I want to get my feet on, like, on the ground and understand how do I do that and how do I live my life in a way that's respectful of all the other people that are marginalized and not getting what I've gotten. And, and using that for other people, not just cashing checks for myself all the time, like I did for the first 10 years of my career. It was like, oh yeah, here's an offer, take it, do this. It was about me, my family, my friends. It, the election, you know, there was a nice silver lining to come out of it, which woke a lot of people up. And a lot of people are like, how do I become a better kind of citizen? So in the beginning of the special, you sit down with uh, Tiffany Haddish and, and Kevin Hart, sort of in the same business, you've done stand-up, and they talk about their experiences in getting work and being recognized. I mean, give me an example now when you look back at your career, the doors that were open, specifically that you were white, that maybe aren't open for Tiffany. Uh, I mean, I just got away with, you know, my whole career was, my first book was called a Horizon, My Horizontal Life, a collection <laughs> of one night stands. I was <laughs> rewarded for that kind of loud, drunken, bad behavior that girls weren't supposed to have. I don't think a person of color would have had success in the, in the same way that I had because I got away with it. And I've gotten away with things my whole life that I just never looked at that way. I thought it was, oh, it's because of your personality. It's because a lot more of that. I mean, it's a lot more, it's a lot deeper than that. There was a moment in the special, and I, I really um, would ask everyone to watch if you haven't already, where you're sitting down with four or five women, I think they're from Orange County, um, seemingly all accomplished professional women with families. And one of them stands up and says, um, you're talking about police shootings, and I think the shootings of young African-American men. And she says, you know, listen, I, I see this on TV all the time. I just don't see what the issue is. I don't ever see that in my neighborhood. That, to me, summed up white privilege, which is you're in Orange County, which I don't think is the most diverse place in the world, um, and you weren't seeing the school shootings. When you're doing with that, when you're doing that in the special, I don't, I don't think you're there to make fun of them. You're there to listen. And there weren't, you know, eye rolls or, you know, sort of, um, you know, sounds being made when these answers were coming. But do you think in the moment that those ladies realized what they had said and there was learning there or it was lost on them? Um, I think they probably got a lot of feedback after it aired. And I'm sure they heard it uh, because they did sound very uneducated. And if you are, sur I mean, I think I'm woke. I go and start shooting this documentary, and my director is like, "Where, you know, 
give me your history of where you've lived. I'm like, I grew up in Livingston, New Jersey, in a very Jewish, Italian, white neighborhood. Yeah, shout out for that. And, <laughs> and then I moved to Brentwood, and then I moved to Bel Air. Like, and I think i am got it together. Like, I'm moving, you know, I'm completely isolating myself in the same way. So a, a theme that I picked up on is... As you're speaking to people, you go to Oktoberfest, you're sitting down with individuals, you're, you're in these groups in Orange County. The biggest thing that I sort of realized were that when you're talking about white privilege and, and sort of owning that, everyone seemed to take it as something that they were giving up, that they were getting taken away from. How do you deal with, you know, sort of the benefits that you've had with, and, and wanting, you know, whether it be any other race to have those benefits and not feeling like it's taken away from you? Well, that's the first, I think, area that you have to address. It's like just because equality to a lot of people means that they're losing something. And that's the thing that people, they don't want to be things to be taken away. I mean, men right now are like, oh, enough with this. Women, you know, taking all of our positions and diversity taking all of our positions. It's like, well, you guys have had an advantage for a really long time. So it's time to like even the playing field. So it's not comfortable for everybody, but it's necessary. There's an overcorrection, I believe, in order to have like, you know, to come back to normal ground. So people have to really understand that they've been given huge advantages. And I understand that for myself and you know not everybody has the luxury of saying okay I could afford to not have all these advantages for a while not everybody you know people have children to feed and they have you know schools to pay for especially in Los Angeles so I understand that you know people aren't comfortable with it but I think the uncomfortableness is what we all need we can all just we all deserve to be a little bit more uncomfortable have uncomfortable conversations if it means for the greater good and being just kind of a better you know human being all the way around which I mean is anybody against that you know, there's a segment where you're sitting down, I think, with a lot of poets and academics. Most of the room is black. You're basically the only white person in there. It is a very uncomfortable position that you put yourself in, but I think the whole point of the special. Um, one lady s stands up and basically says she's embarrassed that you're there. She's embarrassed that she's there. Um, the, the, my personality would be wanting to win her over in the room. What, what was that like, you know, sort of being in that room and being the target of animosity that you didn't create but that you've benefited from? Yeah, it was, I know, I mean, it's not comfortable, but whatever. Again, I can be uncomfortable. Yeah, these people are angry at me walking into their space and taking. You know, I, I had a lot to learn, too. On that first day, Netflix called me and told me I had to take sexual harassment training classes. And I'm like, what? I'm like, I haven't hit on anybody. And I had touched a woman on her butt, a black woman, I gave her a hug and I kind of like brushed her like that and tapped her on the butt like, good job. Don't know this woman, she was offended. And I didn't understand why initially until I called her on the phone and I said, you know, I don't know what I did and I was defensive. And she's like, black women have been defined by their hair and their asses since the beginning of time. You have no business touching me. You don't know what my history is. You don't know what I've been through. And I was like, oh, yeah, you're right. I don't know what you've been through. So, I mean, choosing to resist the information you're getting is choosing to be part of the problem rather than being part of the solution. You've, you have this public forum to be able to do these things. Do you have friends that you can turn to? I have a, a friend of mine who's a um, very successful music manager, uh, a black man, and he told me a story about how um, when he bought his kid a car for the first time, sitting down with his son and explaining that as a black man in L.A., if you get stopped, here's what you need to do. It was the most heartbreaking you know, conversation that I think I'd heard in a while because that never occurred to me in my first car that I have to have my hands on top of the wheel and I have the yes sir, no sir. In fact, it's likely that I would argue with the cop. Um, those are the kinds of things that make me very uncomfortable, but I have some friends that I actually like turn to to ask those questions before I'd go into a public forum. Is that something that you start with or you go directly into the public forum? Uh, no, I mean, you can use instances from your life. Like, I used to go grocery shopping with my friend and those sample things that they have, the candy bins. I would go in, take a gummy bear, take this, or did I eat it while we were walking. And she's like, you're shoplifting. I'm like, no, I'm not. I'm just snacking, you know? And, <laughs> and my friend, went, as I, you know, in adult life, my friend who's black is like, are you 
fucking kidding? We would never walk into a grocery store and just take candy and eat it. That's privilege. You know, not every white person is shoplifting as I am, but you get the message. You know, there's all these little nuances throughout your day that you're not necessarily paying attention to because, you know, why would you? You have your own life to lead. You're, you're taking care of your own people. And there are things, you know, you, you're not, you don't spend your day thinking about other people, but at a certain point, you know, we have to start doing that a little bit more. So my last question on the special, and I really, again, want everyone to watch it is, so in high school, you're a little wild, you're 15 or 16 years old, you're living in New Jersey, you have a black boyfriend, and while you guys are getting wild, um, he's been arrested a couple of times and you're in the car with him. Yeah. Explain that situation and ultimately why you look back at it in the special um, for everybody, because it's, it's heartbreaking. Basically, two kids the same age that love each other, doing the same stuff, but one pays a price and one doesn't. Yeah, we, he, we got caught with like a dime bag of weed twice, maybe, yeah, I think it was twice. And each time the police officer told him to, that, told me to go back home and get out of here and they arrested him. And he had a full scholarship to play uh, basketball, UNLV, that fell apart. As soon as he was put into the system, he didn't, you know, there was no chance of him going to school like that. He couldn't afford his legal bills, so then they mounted, and then they turned into warrants for his arrest. You know, it's just a whole cycle. And at the time, I was just like, oh, I'm having fun in the black community, you know, and then went home to my white family when I was done. And do you think that the, that, that first time getting caught up in the system ultimately made it an inevitability of what would happen to him later? It makes it, once you're in the system, I would argue that, it, I mean, not argue, it's very clear that it makes it very hard for you to get out of it. So they're looking for young black men to make mistakes. Me, they're looking to help me get out of my mistakes. You know, the system is on our side. They don't want to arrest me because I'm a young, white, cute Jewish girl. They're going to arrest the black guy. And you ever get a sense that while you were dealing with those authorities that they were seemingly saying to you, we want to get you away from him? Yes, for sure. Like that he was a bad influence? Yeah, I believed he was a bad influence too. Meanwhile, I was smoking pot with him. I'm like, how could you introduce me to this stuff? <laughs> it's hard. <laughs> Heartbreaking. Um, you know, the, as I was mentioning, I was, on the, uh, I was on the red eye the day of the election. I think we spoke as I landed. Um, and ever since then, my taste in media has changed a little in that I tend to like dystopian stuff and yet the real world seems to her surpass uh, fiction. So I seek out comedy constantly, um, whether that be Wedding Crashers on TV again or you know, one of your specials. Um, and you've returned to stand-up. And I don't think I'd ever gone to a stand-up club until recently, thanks to Donald Trump. What, what do you love about stand-up and, and why have you returned to the live stage? Because it's not exactly the way that you, you hit the amount of people you hit on Netflix or on TV. Tell us about it. Uh, I did my book. I had a book come out last year, and I did a book tour for that. And I was doing speaking engagements, interviews. And during that, I, I hadn't done stand up in five or six years because I had burned myself out with my talk shows and my tours and my books. I just had gone full throttle, like full speed ahead, to the point where I didn't want to do any of it. And so it kind of was a natural progression. And then as I was doing my book tour, I'm like, this is a stand up show. And if I could take if I could take a book about death and grief, and loss and make it into a stand-up special, then I really have a message and I have something to say. So that's what I've been working on and I haven't, no industry has seen it, but I'm sure uh, everyone's coming to see it next month. So I'm back to stand-up in a way that was completely organic and is necessary in this time. I mean, this is a very dark time. It's, it's fucking depressing. Every single day you turn on these impeachment trials and you're like, oh my God, the corruption is at such a level that yeah, I welcome any chance I can to spread light and joy and funniness and get people out of their heads, but also remind them that Donald Trump is a giant asshole and we have to vote him out in 2020, you know, <laughs> with that message always. In, in a world of social media and people not looking each other in the eye, is there something about seeing the audience that's different than television or film or... or yeah, I mean, I think I had a little bit of a come to Jesus after this whole thing. I, I wanted my life to get back. I wanted to be grounded again. I felt like I had gone all, you know, all over the place. And I wanted to be solid and be on solid footing. And for me, it was about going to therapy. It was about learning how to meditate, how to slow down. Cannabis was a big part of that because the legalization of cannabis in California allowed me to pivot from my passion for pharmaceuticals to cannabis, which is <laughs> the much healthier option. You're evolving. Yes, I'm evolving. Yeah. <laughs> Baby steps. Um, 
Also, you know, it's so much better than alcohol, cannabis. I mean, it's a great alternative to, you know, once you're in your 40s, I don't want to be bloated and, and shit-faced anymore. It's not, <laughs> it's not a hot look, you know? I want to get to the cannabis, and hopefully you brought something for me in a second. Um, I don't think you could handle the cannabis, Jason. But, you know, as Snoop Dogg says, you know, the edibles don't have any off button, so they, they hurt me sometimes. Um, you know, Dave Chappelle did this special on Netflix, and I had read about it before. And he's making fun of Anthony Bourdain killing himself and saying he doesn't believe the Michael Jackson uh, molestation charges. And all of a sudden, I'm like, my beloved Dave Chappelle, I don't know that I'm going to be able to watch this. And I run into a friend and he asked me if I've seen it. And I said, I don't think I'm going to watch it because he supposedly says this, this, and this. And he says, Jason, you forgot the reason for comedy. It's about the joke. It's about making you laugh. It actually doesn't even ma you know, matter what the position is. And yet we're in a time where Todd Phillips, who made Old School, doesn't want to make comedies anymore because the studios won't put out movies that are necessarily making fun on race or religion or anything else. What is the state of comedy like when everyone's so woke and there's a cancel culture, can you still make fun of people? Yeah, you just have to be a little bit more creative about who you're making fun of and start with yourself. You know, you don't have to make fun of some huge swaths of people, or you do. I mean, it's not to be taken so seriously. It's not to be thought about that seriously. For me, stand-up is important to have a message. Like, if you can send a message through laughter, that is the best way to get people to pay attention. So that's all, you know, you, you, if you look outside and you look at what everybody else is doing, I don't think that's a good prescription for your own true kind of north or what have you, you know. I, you know, I read a lot and I, I think I'm open-minded and yet I was pushed to watch that special on someone I'm a fan of and I thought it was brilliant. And, I, I, and, and to me, I don't know that there is a line. You know, Jerry Seinfeld was saying in his Netflix special, there is no line, it's always about the joke. Uh, or Chris Rock would say he's a prof professional arguer. He doesn't really care what side he's on as long as he can argue it. Yeah. Um, that's what I, you know, I look for that in comedy. Who are you loving in stand-up these days? Uh, Fortune Feimster. She, I love her, yeah. Uh, a, a girl, Takara Comedy. I mean, you know, there's always, there's always great comedians. And right now, there, you know, female comedians are happening because of Netflix. Netflix yep. brought back comedy for um, a lot of people. So it's exciting to see all the people that are coming up. So let's talk about cannabis. Um, when I was writing in my newsletter during the election, I took a lot of political stances that I had never taken before, and I lost a big part of the audience. And every day that I'd write some angry rant, I'd get an email from like the CEO of Calm saying, hey, looks like you need to meditate a little, or hey, can I you know, take you to this microdosing weekend? Um, I have to say... Microdosing mushrooms are coming up, too. You're going to want to start doing that. I, I got a lot of issues, so I'm open to all the ideas. Uh, I will say that vape pens, uh, you know, for lack of knowledge about how safe they are or not, have taken the edge off what's going on in the world. Um, tell us about your move into cannabis and what it's doing for you personally, but also what you want it to do for your audience that you're selling to. Um, well, another contrast, you know, my ex-boyfriend was in prison for, um, you know, cannabis and was arrested twice, and now I'm coming out with my own cannabis line, so there you go, there's another example. <laughs> um, I, I just, I found it to be a huge relief. I was looking at the news, and I was, like, addicted in the beginning of the presidency, and I was on it, you know, a 24-hour kind of, like, when are they going to drag him out of the White House in his underpants and, you know, throw him in the Rose Garden, like, I thought that was imminent. And after about a year, I was like, oh, shit, this looks like it could go on for a while. And, you know, being stoned and, er, and dealing with the, the stuff that's going on or being stoned and seeing Kellyanne Conway is kind of funny on the news, you know? <laughs> Sarah Suckabee Sanders came out one day, I remember, for one of her press briefings, and she had green eyeshadow shrouding all one eye and nothing on the other eye. And I was like, oh my God, even her makeup artist, he hates this woman. You know, I was like, oh, this is great. So uh, it just kind of made me laugh at all of it, even though, you know, it's, it's not funny, but sometimes it is. And it made me take a step back and realize that I was giving everything to this administration and all my anger was at such a 10. I needed to take back my life and take back control. I wasn't one going to give that administration another year of my, my madness. And I needed to get, like, I needed to... Get it under control, pretty much. And, and, and is this about, is, is cannabis to you about mental health? Is it about anxiety? Like, what are you trying to accomplish with your line? 
Um, my line is for women and first-time users, people who've had a bad experience with edibles or bad experience with um, weed who are overwhelmed by it. You know, I think a lot of people need an introducer. They need an introductory like brand to say, hey, I'm just going to take this one milligram or this, these two milligrams, see how I feel. And you need somebody to walk you through it. And I've spent the last year and a half, two years, you know, walking through weed and finding out what is good, what's light, what's going to give somebody the right buzz and not to be overwhelming, not to be dosed like it used to be with edibles. It's a whole new world and like so it's not going anywhere. It's becoming legal all across the country and for me, you know, I had trouble sleeping and I didn't want to take sleeping pills anymore and so cannabis was that for me and for other people it's so helpful with anxiety, you know, with just the stress of life and it's it's an, and, and I want women to be emboldened and empowered in the way that men are with cannabis, you know? So it's for women, you know, from a woman, and, and it's to help people like, hey, come here, I've got a secret, this is how you do this. You know, you don't have to have five drinks at dinner. You can have one drink at dinner and have an edible, and it's just everything's better. I still feel there's a stigma there. You know, I have guessed I said on stage that I've used a vape pen before, but it's not something that I would offer Well, the up. vape pens are out of style, so get rid of but, that. Yeah, yeah, well, you know, it's like I'm, I'm still skiing when everyone's snowboarding. But, but um, I, I guess there still is a stigma. You know, you, if you heard someone was on an SSRI or taking an opioid, there's, a, there's certainly a stigma there. But yet people, I, I've, I've had people say, hey, can you get me a pen because I may run for office one day or I don't want my employer to know. When, when does that stigma go away? Do, do, is it something where insurance companies have to cover it for medicine? Or where do you, how do you see this trajectory working so that it becomes something that's accepted? I think it's pretty, it's becoming destigmatized as we speak. In the last two years alone, the destigma, I mean, the stigmatization has, is, has evolved and people are reacting differently to it. You know, people are, fly, I mean, you could fly in and out of California, FAA regulations with it. Like, it's, everyone's opening it up, you know, and can't, everywhere you go, I, I, I travel with weed all the time. And people are like, how are you doing that? It's like, because no one gives a shit. No one's looking for your gummy bears, you know? And like, that's not what people at the airport are looking for. They're looking for bombs and mass amounts of drugs. So things that are, you know, and especially with, you know, what we've learned about the opioid, you know, crisis in the last couple of years. I mean, come on, we can't, we're, we're poisoning ourselves. Our government is giving us stuff to poison ourselves. So if something grows out of the ground, that looks like a much better option than all of this synthetic bullshit. Do you see, I don't know if you follow this, but do you see with the problems with opioids and sports for pain injuries and whatnot, do you see at some point cannabis being something that's respected and, and diagnosed? Yeah, I think so, for sure. I mean, it's definitely not a performance enhancer. Like, you're not going to get in trouble for, like, you know, taking an edible for a football game. It's like, that's not going to help you. So, uh, yeah, what's the problem if it helps with pain? And it does. CBD has been so helpful with so many people with arthritis and various issues. Got it. So you, you, you've got podcasts, you've got books, you're doing tours, you're doing stand-up, you've done TV. I, I don't remember if you've done a film. Um, you know, the medium is way different than it used to be where you had TV or film as the prize. How do you sort of rank what you're gonna do as a podcast, what you're gonna do as a, a book? I mean, how important are those things? Is it, is it the revenue opportunity that a podcast doesn't have, so you'll do them less, or is it really just about the message of the medium? I mean, for me, a long time, I mean, for a long time, it was not about really anything other than like, you, you know, what I felt like doing and how much of it I felt like doing. And now I try to be much more thoughtful about the decisions I make and the, and the creative stuff I'm doing. I want to make a contribution. You know, you can't do that necessarily with every project, but I would argue that you can, you know? Like, I can write a book about my experience with therapy and have it be a number one New York Times bestseller and have it affect people in a great way. And people respond in a way, I would go into therapy for the first time because I saw the difference that it had in you or that it made in you. You know, the documentary, I don't, obviously, I can pick whatever subject I want to make a documentary about, but I want to be somebody that is uh, that is always a learning and evolving and growing and challenging myself. I don't want to be comfortable. I want to be uncomfortable. You know, in the, in the Netflix special Chelsea does, you've, you've dealt with sex and drugs um, and uh, in white privilege you're dealing with racism, but they're not overtly political. There's some politics inside of the, the white privilege one. As you've taken these stances, were you worried about your audience? I know I lost a lot of my audience assuming that my audience thought like I did. It wasn't the case, and maybe I took something that was more media-focused and made it more political, and that was my mistake. 
were you worried about losing any of your audience at all? Um, no, I mean, I've always lost, I'm always, you know, you're always losing and gaining people. And I mean, you can't, I can't direct my behavior towards what my audience wants, you know, to a degree, but not really. I mean, that's not sincere or authentic or what, you know, and, and I'm not that type of girl and I've never been that type of girl and I don't think anyone expects that from me. You worked with Morgan Neville on some of these projects and I believe I just saw the um, Miss Americana Taylor Swift doc at Sundance, which Morgan did. And there's a scene in there where she talks about how the, Di the Dixie Chicks took a stance against Bush and it destroyed their career. Country music's very conservative. And for years, she was basically told, you don't talk about that stuff. And there's a scene where her parents and her manager are basically imploring her not to make a statement about guns in the Senate race in Tennessee um, because it will hurt her career and hurt her audience. And Taylor basically says, you know, she was a young 14 when she became a star and it took her a long time to catch up to 29, meaning she wants to take and own her own career. That's an example of someone who's, I, I don't know if it's putting on the line, but has your, has your management, Irving or otherwise, ever said, or they know better, we don't think you should do this for those reasons? Oh, no. I remember Irving Azoff said, I saw somebody at the Beverly Glen <laughs> Center, shopping center, oh, Joe Walsh's wife, and she came up to me and she said, oh, I just saw Irving and I was telling him how, how much I like how loud you're being on Twitter about Donald Trump, and, and she goes, and Irving just said, oh, she's killing her career. <laughs> So that's my manager um, representing me. Yeah. <laughs> that's Irving, you know. Yep. He doesn't know what the fuck he's saying. From and yet you're still getting night. paid, so something must be working. Yeah, right. so he said, yeah, I was like, don't worry, I'm going through a phase right now. I'm really pissed off. I'll come out the other side, you know, which, you know, you always do. Nothing's permanent. Everything is temporary, especially in this town. Sure. You know, uh, you know I've got the message from you that it's never too late to learn. It's never too late to change. You like putting yourself in, in these uncomfortable positions. Um, and you know, we've talked a lot about what we read and what we watch, and I don't think I've dealt with it as constructively as you do. I seem to, like, you know, if you put me on Twitter and put a heart monitor on me, my resting heartbeat would be 66. You put me on Twitter for two seconds, it's up at 100. And I let it internalize me. And, yet, and then I'll blame politicians or I'll blame media. What responsibility do we have for our own information intake? I mean, do a you- A lot. Do I you, mean, we need to be a little bit more. Yeah, I mean, I know, I've, I've gotten a book or, someone's like, can, can you tweet about this? And it's like, you know, you need to know what the hell you're tweeting about and you need to know what you're supporting. You can't just say yes to all these different people that are asking you things because you have to do due diligence so that people can rely on you and when you make a mistake, say it, I fucked up, you know, I didn't know what I was talking about here because you need to have credibility and I don't know, you know, you, sometimes I read things, I'm like, is this true? You know, we're all kind of questioning everything right now. So to have a reliable sense of, uh, who you could go to for those news sources and which articles and news foundations are really the most reliable is important and that's and that goes for I think individuals too you know we want to steer each other in the right direction not the wrong one you know we have the, what they call the democracy a democratization of publishing um, basically every community has their influencers and their publications and it's likely that you're never going to see anything that you don't already agree with. Mm. I remember I called up um, Essie Cup from CNN, who's sort of their conservative um, pundit or analyst, and I said, give me 20 um, you know, pundits that I don't read on a daily basis that's on the other side of the aisle that aren't insane so that I can actually test what I'm reading in my news because I know that I'm, I, I have a predisposition to want to agree with something and not check it. Do you do that on your own? Will you go to publications that you think are not of your frame of mind just to see what the other side's saying? For a li I try to, but it doesn't last long because I just, you know, I try to watch Fox News or read Fox News or Breitbart or some of those things just to understand, but it's so angry making that I'm like, ugh, it's hard to like really get into it. Last question I, I have, you know, we hear a lot about Fox. I used to work at News Corp um, before they split up. And you hear about talent saying, you know, I'm going to pull my show. I'm not going to work with them. Do you need to be on the same political spectrum as the people that distribute and, 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 uh, and buy your stuff? And should you boycott them or no? Yeah, we should probably be boycotting them. But the reality of that happening, I mean, how many people are going to forego their salaries and say, fuck it? You know, we should be boycotting Fox. I mean, we should. Even if you're not in that division, meaning if you give stuff to the broadcast network but you're not on Fox News, the overall parent should still... I don't know about the intricacies of yeah. that. I don't want to speak to that because I would have to think about that. But 
Yes, I mean, look what they represent and look what they've created. I think we should be taking a bigger stand. And it's hard to create a movement, as we all know, even though Greta Thunberg seems to have done it with her eyes closed. I mean, look at what she just created. By, by, you know, it's easier said than done. I mean, sorry, it's not easier said than done. It can be done, but we don't seem to, you know, have the forces joining to, together. I know personally I've tried to start a bunch of things and you get a bunch of people on deck and then everybody's, you know, it's very hard to do that. So it would be nice to have a more concerted effort. Well, listen, you're, you're a good friend. You're an inspiration. I'm going to get baked after this. I'm going to laugh. Are you? Are you going to get baked after no, this? No, I have to have Ted Sarandos in the afternoon, so probably afterwards. But uh, thank you so much for coming. Chelsea Handler, everybody. Uh, thank you.